Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to, uh, to Politics and Prose. Uh, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the store, along with my wife, uh, Lisa Muscatine. Uh, and, and today we're going to be talking about, um, uh, about one of these uh, uh, small books. You may, you may have seen uh, books like this uh, around, around the store before. Uh, uh, we had an event for, for another one not, not, not too long ago. They are, um, there's an interesting story uh, behind these. Uh, they are published by uh, an imprint called uh, Columbia uh, Global Reports. Uh, and and, and the, the story behind uh, CGR uh, is this. Um, about six years ago, uh, Nick Lehman, uh, who was stepping down as the dean of the uh, Columbia Journalism School, uh, had an idea uh, to start uh, a, a new imprint for books. Uh, he envisioned a university-funded publishing operation uh, that would produce about uh, ha half a dozen uh, works of journalism and analysis each year, uh, each on a, on a different uh, underreported story uh, around the world. Uh, and that's really how uh, Columbia Go Global Reports uh, got started. And it's gone on uh, to uh, publish more than, uh, more than 20 titles uh, since then. Uh, the books are, are compact, you know, like, like you see here. Uh, they run anywhere from 100 to 150 pages and come in this sort of trim, you know, five inch by, by seven and a half inch size. Uh, and they're produced uh, relatively quickly, which allows writers to address relevant, uh, relevant often complex issues uh, in a timely way. Uh, and so it was that, that Jeffrey uh, Wasserstrom a specialist in Chinese history who's with us this afternoon, uh, received backing from, from CGR to report on the rising tensions in Hong Kong. Uh, Jeff's new book, A Vigil, uh, chronicles two clashing uh, developments in the former British colony. Uh, on the one hand, China's concerted efforts since the 1997 handover uh, to strip Hong Kong of its freedoms. And on the other, the actions of many in the city to resist China's uh, repressive moves and keep Hong Kong's special, separate, autonomous status. Uh, Jeff is a history professor at the University of California, Irvine, uh, and has been researching and writing about China for uh, more than 30 years, uh, starting with a work on student protests in 20th, 20th century China. Uh, he's written several previous books and numerous articles uh, about China for, for popular media. Uh, in Vigil, uh, Jeff draws on his many contacts in China, uh, weaving into the book some of his own on-the-ground reporting uh, and interviews with protest leaders. Uh, he's not uh, a detached observer. Uh, you'll have no problem discerning where Jeff's sympathies lie uh, between the opposing sides in Hong Kong, but his writing is clear and straightforward and turns the complex historical and human dynamics surrounding the Hong Kong protests into a compelling an easily accessible narrative. Uh, Jeff will be in conversation uh, this afternoon with Ishan Tharoor, uh, who after graduating from Yale about a decade and a half ago, joined Time Magazine as a correspondent based in Hong Kong, uh, where he stayed for several years. He then moved to New York for time, and today is on the staff of the Washington Post writing about foreign affairs. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Wasserstrom and Ishan Tharoor. On. Yep, that's on. Well, well, thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, and, and thank you all for being here on a, on a very lovely Sunday afternoon uh, in D.C. Uh, it's a real delight to be be able to moderate a session here at, once more at Politics and Prose, and especially to be, to be alongside Jeff Wasserstrom. Uh, this is actually the first time we've ever met, although for years I feel like I've known him, and he's such an incredible friend to journalists, the most wonderful, uh, sort of illuminating, uh, insightful uh, scholar of Chinese history, and, uh, and somebody who is, is so generous with his time and, and his contacts and resources as well. So it's a real pleasure to finally meet you, actually. And uh, it goes, goes both ways. Thanks. <laughs> and, and you know, this is, this is a great book. Don't be fooled by its size. It packs in quite a lot. It's a great, breezy read. Uh, it's political history of Hong Kong. It's social history. 
of protest movements in China and Hong Kong. It's uh, uh, some fascinating moments of on the ground reporters there as well. And of course, it has uh, a good degree of the, the trenchant and clear eyed analysis that, that we're used to you know, hearing from, from anybody who's familiar with Jeff's commentary would know. Uh, so, so definitely get it after the session. Um, I think the one thing though, even though this was produced uh, in a very timely manner and uh, with a degree of speed, uh, the one thing that is not in this book is what probably is on your mind right now, uh, which is the, the ramifications of the coronavirus outbreak in China. Um, it obviously, you know, it's killed more than 1,400 people. It's led to a huge kind of uh, realignment of resources and strategies in China. And it's, of course, rippled through Hong Kong as well. So I was wondering, before we dive into the book, um, what would your next chapter be <laughs> about... Uh, Hong Kong and the coronavirus outbreak. That's great because it it sounds like there should be a second edition, and you know that's that's wonderful. Um, well, one thing I'd say, I in the book, this book felt more like a collective enterprise than things I've done before. In part because I did it so fast, I had to draw on people giving me advice along the way and answering questions, including people on the ground. And so I really drew very heavily on works by some journalists there. Especially one of them I draw on heavily is Ilaria Maria Sala. And she's written about being on the ground in Hong Kong during this and places it in the context of the SARS um, issue that she also did. So I would encourage you to read what she writes for Quartz about that side of it. Um, so I'd say a couple of things. One is that though I haven't succeeded necessarily in convincing all um, editors that I've pitched the idea to of this, that I think actually the coronavirus underscores why the fight to maintain a free press or some degree of freedom of press in Hong Kong should be globally important. One thing that helped expose the cover-up on SARS was the fact that you had Hong Kong so near to the mainland with access to information there that wasn't controlled by the mainland strictures on the press. So for those of you who thought that Hong Kong was a story that was interesting but over there and didn't really have any relevance to the America unless you followed the NBA, the coronavirus shows that at a, at a political and health level, having some place that close to China that has freedom of press actually is something that helps public health. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is that within Hong Kong, in the short run, the coronavirus has, of course, been a check on mass gatherings because people don't want to get together in large groups. In the longer run, though, it's, it's, there are a group of people who are ambivalent or just uninterested or even against the protesters who now are pissed off at Carrie Lam for seeming to take directives from Beijing rather I than listening to local. Oh, sure. The chief executive of Hong Kong. So, there are, so the protesters have always targeted her as somebody who's doing Beijing's bidding. And they're think, they've often been thinking of, of political issues. But there are some people now who didn't care about the protests, but feel that Carrie Lam taking directives from Beijing is endangering their health. So when the protests reignite, or if they don't reignite, if there's just an ongoing struggle, there'll be people who will be more sympathetic to the protesters once they've got. The other thing that's happening, though, is while this, there's a lull in the protest, the police have continued to arrest a lot of people based on past protests. So it's both sort of a check on protests and undermining of the protesters and something that's bringing more support to the movement. So that would be the next chapter. Okay, so then we'll see, we'll see exactly, you know, depending on how this outbreak goes, we'll see in what direction the protest movement also follows, uh, and as well as, uh, I mean, because there's also a huge level of, you know, there's cultural animus there as well. They want to shut the border with China, uh, and, and there's a degree where this also plays, into, plays up the kind of idea of Hong Kong identity right. as well, right? Um, well, I, I, I want to get back to that, but let's step back. Let's talk about what happened in 2019. This was... Uh, an outgrowth of protests that were sparked by uh, a, a law that was very controversial among Hong Kongers about extradition. Uh, but it wasn't really about the extradition law ultimately, right? Because we saw months of sustained protests uh, in almost unprecedented fashion. Uh, so talk us through you know, what you think these protests, why, why they came about, um, why they've been so sustained, and, and to what extent 
they are part of a continuity with other earlier forms of uprisings in Hong Kong? Or, or, or to what extent do they represent a kind of break from the past as well? So that's, they are a continu they're both a continuity and a break. And protesters are thinking about what had happened before and how to do things differently, and the situation keeps changing. But the protests in Hong Kong, Hong Kong became a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China in 1997. And the promise was that it would have a high degree of autonomy and an ability to keep going its own way in many realms for 50 years. The framework was called One Country, Two Systems. You'd be part of the one country of the PRC and with things like foreign affairs, you wouldn't set your own agenda, but in other ways, there would be a separate system. And there's been tension ever since then on what does it mean for Hong Kong to be able to have a different system. It's become quite clear that what Beijing really thinks about that is having a different economic system and function. Macau is the other former colony. Hong Kong used to be a British colony. Macau used to be a Portuguese colony. They both became special administrative regions. In Macau, the political life is largely fairly compliant but the economic life is quite different. You can gamble there. And Beijing has made it clear now, Xi Jinping says that, you know, that's what one country, two systems means. In Hong Kong, and so Beijing would like it if Hong Kong was financially different, if foreign companies felt more comfortable there. Maybe it had different kinds of protections of law and on property. But what protesters have felt all along is that this two systems means greater freedom of speech, more the right to protest, independent courts that can do things that the police disagree with, um, and so forth. So there have been a series of protests back as far as 2003 that are sparked usually when Beijing tries to tighten its hold on it, on Hong Kong. In 2003, they introduced an anti-sedition bill, and hundreds of thousands of people in Hong Kong protested. The law wasn't that different from the Patriot Act that went in about the same time in the US. And so maybe that helped Beijing think, you know, people are getting serious about sedition, we can, we can tighten there. But people said this is an infringement on our high degree of autonomy. And this was also around the time of SARS and there was, that was part of the backdrop for it as well. Giant peaceful protests and the government backed down. They withdrew this Article 23 anti-sedition law. So at that point, people felt, okay, one country, two systems kinds of works. We don't get to appoint our own chief executive. The chief executive comes to power through an election, but an election that only about 2,000 people in a, in a political community of 7.5 million can vote in. And the chief executive is always somebody who Beijing thinks is acceptable. But hey, if large protests can lead to a change, something's working. 2012, there was another effort by Beijing to tighten the screws, this case by bringing in a patriotic education uh, thing that would change the way civic education worked in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong schools, you learn about the Tiananmen protests and the June 4th massacre. In mainland schools, you don't, as an example. And so a group of largely high school students, including that time a 14-year-old named Joshua Wong, who went on to become globally famous, um, pushed back. And once again, the government l listened to an extent and withdrew uh, the bill. 2014, a protest was made to try to like firm up Hong Kong's ability to control its own fate by changing the way the chief executive was um, elected through real elections. For 79 days, uh, people occupied three parts of um, Hong Kong. It was around the time of Occupy Wall Street. It was right after the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan that had an occupation. So something was in the air for that. In Hong Kong, this failed. It was largely nonviolent, and the government didn't, didn't push back. One of the key songs in the movement was, I, I, I always have to bring songs in, Do You Hear the People Sing from Les Miserables. And you could say that in earlier, in earlier protests, the government had listened to the people sing. In this case, their, their, their ears were closed. In the Cantonese version of the song, by the way, I don't speak or read Cantonese, but I, I, but I talk to people who do and I read people who do. And the poet Tammy Ho wrote a piece about how when you translate that song into Cantonese, it becomes something more like, who has not spoken up yet? 
Like who, so it's calling on people to show their, their metal. But anyway, the protests did not succeed that point. They were nonviolent. The leaders were, were, have been hassled ever since. Some of them are in jail now. Some of them were put in jail early in 2019. Um, the protesters this time around, there were some protests in between, the protesters this time around said, well, we need to do something differently. Let's have fewer obvious leaders for people to, to, for the government to focus on. So it's been a largely leaderless movement. And let's have more flexible tactics. So we aren't just in one place where when the police want to put an end to it, they can come. So those were different, it's continuing, but also with a difference. And it began, the protest began with protests against another effort to tighten screws, an extradition law that would allow people who had done things that displeased Beijing to be taken over the border to where there are courts that aren't independent to be tried and, and convicted, because that's what happens on the mainland. So the protests were about that bill. And there, were massive pro there was a massive protest on June 9th, an estimated million people marched. A few days later, there was a clash. The police began using strong arm methods, tear gas, and a small group of uh, protesters took occupation of a government building. The another thing after Umbrella was more of a skepticism that nonviolent protests, non-militant protests would achieve things. Um, after that, the hope of the government was as soon as protesters started doing things like vandalism, which they did, um, the populace would be alienated from it. Instead, on the next Sunday, people were more angry by the police actions than by the protesters. Uh, an even larger crowd gathered. Some estimates put it at two million, but otherwise you know, around a million to two million somewhere, which for a, a place of 7.5 million makes it one of the biggest protests in the history of the world, percentage-wise, for a community. So then the movement became, and as much, and the one reason it's gone on so long, as much calling for a check on police brutality, calling for an independent investigation of the police, who for a long time were thought of as un unusually restrained, well-respected force, but now has seemed out of control. And that's, I think, what's kept the movement going, is the refusal to have that independent investigation or, or even apologize for the police. So this, this question of, of violence is, is, of course, very important. Uh, last month, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where Carrie Lam, Hong Kong's chief executive, though she's relatively absent in Hong Kong, she showed up on the, as, as part of a greater tro trade sort of trade roadshow for what what's been dubbed the Greater Bay Area Project, which I'm sure you, you can touch on at some point. It's this idea of Hong Kong as part of a broader network of Chinese cities, uh, and which 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 Hong Kongers also some some Hong Kongers at least see as a threat to their own distinct character and identity as well. Uh, so she was there, and she in long public remarks. Uh, reiterated over and over again, perhaps predictably, uh, the threat of rioters in, in this protest movement, the unacceptable violence that they, they have carried out, uh, and, and of course focuses the conversation on that. Um, how do you understand this, the phase of militancy, the kind of militancy that we've seen? I mean, it's really dramatic when you look at social media, the things the protesters are wearing, the, not necessarily if they're being violent, but there is a kind of fascinating militarization of the of of the scene, uh, so talk a bit about that, and, and and I think there's also a dimension there where people talk about some of those in the protest movement feeling a bit of despair, and is there does the kind of nihilism with their cause play into the violence as well? Great questions. Yeah, there were. Um, there's been a pattern, which is that um, the police use more um, strong arm tactics, in part perhaps to goad um, the most militant members of the, the movement to strike back in ways that can then provide the footage that can be shown relentlessly on the mainland to back up this idea that these are riots rather than largely peaceful, overwhelmingly peaceful with some violence uh, protests. The other thing to keep in mind, it's, it's important to note there have been a, a few actions of um, very, um, very bad violence by protesters against bodies of people. But nearly all of the violence of protesters have been against objects, have been against buildings. It's been, it's been in the form of vandalism, not in the form of attacks on bodies. The police violence has overwhelmingly been at, on bodies. And enormous amounts of tear gas have been used. Rubber bullets have been shot. Uh, bean bags uh, have been shot. 
very little live ammunition has been used. No, no live ammunition bullets were used until October 1st. But I think that was partly because the message being sent from Beijing was, we don't want something that will galvanize international opinion the way Tiananmen did. Handle this yourself. We don't want to bring in troops. And we don't want lots of dead bodies on the ground. So, they're, so wounded people have been wounded in terrible shape. And this leads to some of the nihilism. Um, tear gas has been used. Tear gas is used against protesters in open spaces all over the world. When, when there are big, big demonstrations. It was used in Hong Kong inside um, subway stations, inside malls. That's not the kinds of places that tear gas is supposed to be used. And of course, somebody like the authorities would say, well, that's because we had to. But it's this dynamic of pushing back and forth. And I think the hope has been that public opinion will be alienated from the protesters as soon as they engage in this kind of activity. The nihilism, I, I also think of it as maybe a kind of last stand mentality. And it's especially among younger protesters. And these are younger protesters who are, younger protesters are going to spend more of their life in um, a Hong Kong after any kind of one country, two systems paradigm is over. You mean after 2047? After 2047. Can you explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, so there was the 50 year expiration date to Hong Kong having a, high, a promised degree of autonomy. So in 2047, that clock runs out. So one, one metaphor that I think was used maybe in the New Yorker piece on nihilism was people, some Hong Kong protesters will talk about there being a doomsday clock. And the younger you are, the more important it is to at least keep the doomsday clock from ticking away too fast. And there is a sense of having more skin in the game the younger you are, which is the same thing we're seeing with the climate change protests. And you know, it's no accident that Greta Thunberg and Joshua Wong are tweeting uh, support to one another. There is a kind of youth activism side to it. Another way it shows up is in the, well, one of the questions that um, Amy Hawkins, a young um, journalist who helped me with some of the research for the book and gets a with contributions by credit on it, we did interviews. And one thing we asked um, Hong Kongers of different generations and, and different um, occupations is, is there a book or novel that you think about when you think about Hong Kong's current predicament? And we got some surprise, we got some expected answers, um, Orwell, 1984, but we also got Titanic, <laughs> because before this wave of protest started, uh, the saying, the, the person who said this is because, you know, the ship's going down, but people are still largely partying. But toward the uh, end of doing the research on the book, I realized I hadn't asked that question of any Hong Konger who was about 20. So I asked this very um, smart young Hong Konger from Yale, a senior there who I'd read a piece by when she was interning at the Washington Post, um, and Hannah Mehan Davis. And she'd written a piece on Lenin Walls that I found inspiring about uh, a protest m mode from the, the movement. And she said, it's easy, Hunger Games. That's what Hong Kongers my age, she grew up there, were all reading and watching about the time of the Umbrella Movement. And now during this movement, what are the Hunger Games about? Young people who face impossible odds and feel um, that it's a life or death situation using relatively primitive weapons like slingshots and bows and arrows and um, Molotov, equivalents of Molotov cocktails to light things on fire. The slogan in the Hunger Games one of, in one of the series is, if we burn, you burn with us this kind of all or nothing sense. And there are young women um, among the people, among the most militant in this. So there were compelling photographs of young women with slingshots and during at one point in November, bows and arrows. And so, and spoiler alert, in the Hunger Games they win. <laughs> so it's a kind of impossible struggle and it resonates with, it, it's, it's a version of David and Goliath where a slingshot also played a role but it's something that, that resonates. And I think that sense, and the longer it goes on, the more you have the sense. And the other thing that some protesters have been saying is you're the ones who taught us that nonviolent action doesn't work. That is only when there's an uptake in militancy that the government gives some kind of exchange. So, I mean, the other thing that was quite striking over the past year when we were basically every weekend sitting here in Washington looking at social media and seeing these dramatic scenes in Hong Kong on a daily, week-by-week -week basis, 
was that you know we experienced this protest movement from afar as part of a much bigger global story in 2019, right? Hong Kong was not the only place on fire. Uh, there, were, there were huge upheaval in Latin America, uh, incredible amounts of protests in, in parts of the Middle East and North Africa. And, uh, and to, to a certain extent, it was quite interesting seeing the, the disparity in reactions and coverage in, in this city especially to mm -hmm. these different protests. I had a, a friend who's a Middle East watcher almost say with frustration, you know, they've killed hundreds of people in the last couple of days in Iraq on the streets who are protesting the exact same way. And, and you guys get upset about someone getting pepper sprayed in the face by a Hong Kong police officer. So I was wondering, I mean, without having to address that complaint, yeah. uh, I'm curious about why Hong Kong resonated so much last year in the minds of Americans and the minds of the global audience. I, I, I have some, some guesses of why, sure. but I'd love to hear where, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, I'm glad you asked that. We've, we, um, at Irvine, I'm part of something called the Forum for the Academy and the Public that is directed by Amy Willens, who's a um, journalist who writes on, who teaches in the literary journalism program there, who her main focus through much of her career has been Haiti. And we do these things called pop-up events that try to do very quickly respond to things going on. And so one thing that Amy says whenever I complain, like there's this really big story in China, it's not getting enough attention, she goes, think about how much more attention China gets routinely than Haiti. And events in Haiti are actually partly, they're partly due to America in the long historical sense. And Haiti's closer to America, but it doesn't. And we actually did a panel getting people t who were following Lebanon, Haiti, Chile, um, and you know, thinking about this as a year of the protester. Um, so um, why Hong Kong resonates? One thing is the Hong Kong protesters are very it's something about Hong Kong itself is people are very cosmo there's a lot of cosmopolitan connectedness from with different parts of the world there's a savviness on the protesters part to do things which we saw with the Tiananmen protests in 89 to a lesser degree but to do things that will capture capture the attention through uh, through symbols through slogans that uh, there's a there's a downside to it because the more something looks like it resonates with the West the easier it is for Beijing to say this is a Western plot or these are unpatriotic protesters. In the case of Tiananmen, and you know, creating the goddess of democracy statue that looked like the Statue of Liberty, even though it had twists, was both very powerful for getting the international attention ramped up and also played into, at that point too, the government said these are rioters, these are, it's all being stirred up by foreigners. In the case of Hong Kong, there have been uses of international symbols, international slogans. Um, the Lenin Wall, which is um, its name for something in Prague in the early 1980s, about John Lennon, not Vladimir Lenin, just so we're clear, um, where people who were inspired, this was the utopian rather than nihilistic side, by imagine the, the line, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. In 2014, during the Umbrella Movement, there was a Lenin Wall put up. The one in Prague, people had painted uh, slogans in 1981 after Lenin's assassination, sort of trying to keep alive that spirit during the Cold War of a kind of hope for a better future. In the Umbrella Movement, there was something similar done, but given a Hong Kong twist, because instead of painting, you put up post-it notes that had little drawings on it for that. During this movement, continuity but also change, protesters have put up Lenin walls all over the place, and some have turned their bodies into Lenin walls by putting post-it notes, and restaurants that show support for the movement put up, turn their windows into Lenin walls. I saw some of those when I was there in December, my last visit, as a way of saying to protesters, you're welcome here, support us, we support you. But, so I think the symbolism, the creativity of the protesters have kept the interest, and also the fact that Hong Kong, you know, has a history as a wind, as a kind of displaced piece of the West next to China, has given it a kind of mystique, and all of these things play, played into it. And I mean, I've already talked a little bit about why we should understand that there's a lot of brutality, even if it isn't killing directly. There have been suicides where people have said, I've killed myself because of my desperation for the fate of the place I love. There are reasons that do it. But They've also had shown creativity to keep the attention going. But right now, I've got to say, the attention is not there. And I've been moved and kind of distressed by the fact that in 
during this book tour, if I promote, well, Ishan wrote a very nice tweet about uh, this event. And a whole series of posts came immediately, uh, responses came from Hong Kong. Thank you for paying attention to Hong Kong. Thank you for not forgetting about us. There have been things complimenting me on the book by people who don't know what's in the book. They're just saying, you're writing about Hong Kong. And it's very weird because three weeks ago, people said, your book is coming out, I don't want to complain here, your book is coming out at the perfect time. Everybody cares about Hong Kong. But by now, that's not the lead Asian story. And we can only have, as you know, <laughs> one or at most two <laughs> leading Asian stories. And now, at the risk of, you know, it's, it's not really meant as a joke, but we, we have a virus and a parasite, and there isn't really room for anything else. So the feel-good story is South Korea. The um, distressing story is, um, is the virus. For a while, Hong Kong was the hopeful story and the distressing story rolled into one. And it kept it going. And I felt bad sometimes then because I thought the most distressing story was what was going on in Xinjiang. And I felt there should be more stories about Xinjiang than there were about Hong Kong, even though I cared so passionately about Hong Kong because of the indoctrination camps and the disappearances of hundreds of thousands to more than a million people into those camps. So we're in the year of the rat. I would say this is a year where US-China relations are in a particularly low ebb. We have uh, an increasingly hardening sense of, of China's authoritarianism, especially when it comes to places like Xinjiang, and the rather terrifying face of what a world order where China has even more influence could look like, given the way they're behaving in certain parts of their own country. Um, the last time we were in the year of the rat was 2008. I was based in Hong Kong at the time. And it was a very different moment, right? We had the Beijing Olympics. Uh, we had the sense that China could be liberalizing in its own ways. There was still that sense that Hong Kong, rather than being this, you know, defending th this bastion on the outside, it was the, the beacon that, could, that would lead the way of reformation, reform in China. And maybe at, by, by 2008, there are some who still believe that. Uh, so talk a bit about what's changed in that time. And, 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 and whether our differing, our, you know, our changing, evolving view of China itself and the be leadership in Beijing, um, I, I guess m sit, map that alongside Hong Kong's protest movement as well. I love this because we didn't talk about this, but I've been trying very hard to place a piece about the two years of the rat. And saying that the year of the rat, the last year of the rat, the Beijing Olympics, the way I describe it, is that was the time one country, two systems actually seemed to work, the last time. Because, and it was one detail about the Olympics uh, on the one country side. The idea was that Hong Kong would gain from being part of a country, one country, without losing because there were two systems. In 2008, the Olympics were the Beijing Games, but the equestrian events were held in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong got a part of the glory. There's also a way in which some Hong Kongers who are now part of the protest movement, remember with a bit of surprise how excited they were about China getting the games, even if now they think um, that the separation from China is crucial. But about the two systems, in 2008, there was the memory of 2003, where there had been this effort to tighten controls on Hong Kong, and protests had led to a change. So in that sense, two systems kind of worked. Because you could, and at this point, the last year has been two systems isn't working. Because these protests are happening, and the government's not budging, and the courts are showing less and less independence. And being part of one country, where's the plus side of that at a moment like, like the virus? So I think that's a change. But I think the other thing is broader. Forget about Hong Kong for the moment. Don't forget about Hong Kong, but for the moment. Since 2008, it's actually the last time that I felt hopeful about the direction that the PRC was going as a whole. Since then, year to year, until then, from like late 90s to early 2000s, when I would go to the mainland from year to year, I would look for signs, like, can you talk about more things without people being self-conscious about what they say? Are there more books that are kind of surprisingly edgy in the bookstores? And year to year, the sense was that very, very slowly, I was never one of these believers in convergence, but at least very, very slowly, there were reasons to hope that the direction was toward a more liberal place. Since 2009, I've never had that experience. And I, I, Xi Jinping is 
a big part of the problem. Things have gotten worse since he came to power as head of the party in 2012 and then president, but it was started before him. So I don't think we should, we should associate it all with him. There's this uh, fascinating line in the book where you speak with Chris Patton, the former, uh, the last British colonial governor of Hong Kong, and uh, since a rather you know, articulate political commentator in general, uh, very opposed to Brexit. Uh, he, tell, he says, you know, I'm going to butcher it, but he says something like, when the ice starts to melt, it melts quickly. It is the most poetic thing, so, any, so anybody. Talk, talk through that, yeah. So anybody who, well, I'll, I'll just say that, first of all, yeah, I, I got to interview my first lord of the realm for this, because he's <laughs> Lord Patton. And I went out to his house um, in Barnes, a leafy suburb outside of London, and I expected a doorman to answer, you know, butler and all this. And he comes and answers the door. You know, I'd arranged to, I mean, he is chancellor of Oxford now. It's kind of his job. But anyway, and we just talked, and we talked about um, books, and, you know, we both like Le Carre, and, you know, we talked about Le Carre having set one book, lots of books in Berlin, and then setting a book in Hong Kong, and how Hong Kong under the, during the Cold War was like a listening post onto a big communist country, and Berlin, West Berlin was, and then since 1989, West Berlin has kind of permeated East Berlin, whereas Hong Kong since 97 has been kind of the ways of the <laughs> communist party. So it's been pulled together, but in the opposite way, through things like the Greater Bay Area. So, um, and then I finally asked him, what would he think of the proposition that people would be, historians of the future would be surprised about how light a touch Beijing exerted on Hong Kong from about 1997 till about 2008, but how quickly the screws had tightened since 2014 <laughs> in particular. And that's when he said this, you know, I, I was thinking up to that point, he, he, this has been interesting, but there's nothing he said that I can quote. And then he said that line about, you know, he just sort of nodded and said, when the snow starts to melt, it melts quickly. And it was pa very powerful. And th there's another, uh, in, in a separate part of the book, there's another image that uh, really stuck in my mind, which is, I think you're citing uh, a local Hong Kong commentator. And again, I'm going to butcher this, this, this turn of phrase, but it's something about, you know, frogs boiling in a pot, right? So, and, and that, that, I mean, again, I'm going to tee you up with the frogs boiling in the pot. So, okay, this is um, not knowing Cantonese. I had to talk to a lot of people who knew Cantonese, but I also spent a lot of time reading um, a website called um, China Heritage, chinaheritage.net, which has been crucial in translating dissident writings from the mainland. It just had a very, uh, it's done very important things on Xu Zhongrun, the most important sort of critical intellectual in China. Jeremy Barme who used to be an Australian, is now in New Zealand, a, an incredibly insightful uh, China, China um, specialist and commentator and cultural analyst, runs it. But during the protest wave, he just focused on Hong Kong a lot and got people to help him and published an enormous amount of valuable expressions of, of things of Hong Kong people. And one of the things he did was Kenny Leong, a local writer, um, and I loved this piece when I saw it, had a writing a piece that about the, the frog in boiling water, that as long as the temperature is turned up slowly, the frog won't jump out. But if it comes up too, too quickly, people will notice and they'll get scared because they're going to be boiled. So she talked about the Hong Kong frogs. And you know this led to a very variety of kinds of, of play. Question, why didn't you jump out earlier? And some, of course, some people of Hong Kong did. They left before 97, saying they didn't want to be part of this. Someone then went back thinking that things were okay, that slow, t that light touch, where the water was just being warmed up. And, but then there are certain moments, it seems to me, when there's been a miscalculation and the government has overreached in interfering. They, they were tightening, if they tightened things very, very slowly, people might not react, but there were certain moments uh, when they miscalculate. The security law, the, um, the, patriotic education, the extradition bill. And at that point, people realize the severity of the situation. And that's another way of thinking about this is life or death. Right. So you mentioned that it's, it's life or death. It's a David and Goliath story. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty, at this point, it, it, it one can't help but feel pessimistic, right? Because they are still going up against a uh, pretty entrenched, uh, intractable uh, state. Uh, there is no indication that any of the maximalist demands they have put forward, not just in the defense of their civil liberties, but also in the pursuit of 
a greater democracy will ever be entertained, either by the local government or Beijing. And yet, still, there is this energy for the movement. There is a mobilization that will keep happening. How do you square you know, both the sense of historical inevitability that people try to put forward about this with the spirit that remains? The way I handle that is to say history is full, full of examples when it was impossible for change to happen and change did happen. Lots of times it doesn't. So that doesn't mean that every time it will. But I think there are, nobody was saying in 1988, the Berlin Wall, that's only going to be there another year. And in fact, you know, if after the solidarity movement, which is one of the analogies, none of these are perfect, but sort of imperfect analogy to think with, I bring into the book, the solidarity movement had tremendous support in 1979 to 1982, and then it was crushed. And if you were writing the history of solidarity in 1985, you'd say, game over. And I read a um, review from 1986 of a book, Adam Micknick, one of the leaders of that movement, wrote Letters from Prison. And the reviewer said, here we are 40 years after uh, the Soviet system came into power. Nobody in Eastern Europe has anything to celebrate about that anniversary. And on the 50th anniversary of that, they're still going to be chafing, and maybe they'll occasionally rise up and be suppressed again. 1996, it was a very different thing. Solidarity had won a victory in Poland on June 4th, 1989. Um, East Germany had risen up and not been suppressed. And there were all these changes. So it's an impossible thing. And yet, sometimes it happens. Also, in Hong Kong now, it's increasingly seen by people as being uh, an anti-colonial movement, in a sense. That the, the tragedy of Hong Kong, in some ways, is to go from being a colony of one place to being a colony of a, actually, a colony of a initially strong but then declining power to now being a colony of a rising power. And actually, you mentioned being at Davos. Um, you were there, I know, from Twitter. Um, Isabella S uh, Steger, who's one of the best journalists covering Hong Kong and maybe the best tweeter uh, covering Hong Kong. And she's one of the first ones who, she's been monitoring what the chatter is within Hong Kong about analogies. And she was very interested in on the upside, protesters are spending a lot of time talking about what happened in Ukraine, Maidan, and saying that was a time when it seemed impossible, yet they won, whatever the later response was. But they're also increasingly talking about Belfast and the possibility of this kind of long, protracted, and that too, that seems impossible. So these things seem impossible until they aren't. Just like authoritarian regimes often seem like they're never going to fall until they do. And people keep predicting they will, and they're wrong. And then sometimes it's just when they stop predicting they, they will fall that they do. So it's the, in, it's the surprising nature of history that I think we need to keep in mind. And anybody who studies Hong Kong history knows it's full of surprises. Hong Kong people were supposed to be apolitical. It was supposed to be a place that wouldn't have the biggest sustained social movements in urban PRC s since 1989. It wasn't supposed to be that way, surprise. It wasn't supposed to be a great city. When it first got <laughs> given to the British, the guy who, who arranged for it to be the prize for the opium board got fired because he'd gotten this unpromising barren hill with hardly a house upon it. So, and I've made some really bad predictions about Hong Kong too. Anybody, it makes fools of forecasters, as does China in general, as do social movements in general. The, one of the last times I was in DC, maybe the last time I was in DC, speaking of surprises, there was the um, anti-gun march that luckily a friend of mine said, you've got to see that. You study youth movements. I was at an academic conference and she convinced me um, to go. And I'm so glad she did because it was a very powerful and moving event. But if you'd asked me a year before that, what about this generation of American high schoolers? Are they going to lead, are they going to be at the forefront of a movement? I would have joined with, I think, most other people my age and say, no way. They're watching their cell phones, taking selfies. They're not going to be politically engaged. Then Parkland happened, and it was different. Climate strikes, too. We have 50 minutes left. I have many more questions, but I, I, I would love to open the floor up to anybody who'd like to ask a question of Jeff. There's a mic right here, so please come up to it if you have a question. Uh, because we've limited time, please keep your remarks to a question. And no, no extended extemporaneous speeches here, please. Uh, if, and please uh, identify yourself with your question when you, when you ask your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kay, a PhD student at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, 
So um, I really like your um, comparison of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the present now. But um, there's the one thing that is very different that Western democracy is also facing populism. So how do you view like this different background when these authoritarian citizens, you know, they try to embrace democracy while democracy itself is in crisis? Great, great question. So I think two things, two things are very different from the situation in around 89. One is that the person in power in Moscow was somebody who was tell calling for restraint against protesters. And I mean, he was somebody less control-minded. And Beijing now is somebody more control-minded. So that makes it different. But you're right. There was more of a clear admiration for a variety of other possibilities. People could imagine at that point there were examples of places outside of the Soviet bloc where people thought, if only our country could be more like X. I don't know where you would look then. I mean, so there's some looking at, you know, Taiwan, perhaps, but, you know, of something that's a kind of viable alternative out there, the fact that the American democracy is in such bad shape is something that costs the world, not just, to, even though it's the same way Hong Kong's story is important for us, our story is important for anybody struggling for change against authoritarianism. And I would try not to mention Trump, but I have to. What he's been doing has not only undermined faith in American democracy, but he's doing exactly the wrong thing with talking tough about China, but praising Xi Jinping, which plays into this idea that is part of what keeps Xi Jinping in power is the world's a really dangerous, messed up place. You need a strong person in control. And Trump, by praising various strongman leaders in different places is undermining struggles for change. I've been fascinated by China f for many years. What I kept thinking watching these demonstrations is Tiananmen. I mean, at the end of the day, um, there are, what you said, uh, eight, billion, 8 million people in Hong Kong and a billion and a half in China. Um, and the Chinese don't seem to have any hesitation about using force, a lot of it. For a long time, look at the Uyghurs. Those are concentration camps. Um, are they fatalistic there in Hong Kong, or do they just figure today's today and we'll do it again tomorrow and we'll do it again tomorrow? And if we're, you know, in the end we're all killed, what have we lost? I just don't know. Thanks. Yeah, I do think I do think it's, there are certain places cases where it seems impossible, but you think what it's almost what do I want to be able to tell myself? Did I, can I tell myself I did enough? And also, there can be an awareness that you just don't know until something happens. And this, you know, people, it's, it's Adam Micknick, who I mentioned, who went right. to jail at the end right. of Solidarity. They made, they made him an offer that he could leave Poland and he wouldn't be in jail. And he said to this beautiful thing, I'm not gonna leave because when, when I care so much about this and there's a beauty to the struggle, even when it's impossible. And, you know, so I think there's, and, and things can shift, and we don't know when they'll shift. And Ishan wrote a wonderful piece recently about people trying to track, we're always trying to read the signs of what could be the cracks within the Chinese system. And of course, each, and in this case, it was the, the analogy of Chernobyl, could, could the virus in response to it be China's Chernobyl moment that undermines faith in the, in the Communist Party? At some point, something, something will change either for the better or the worse on the mainland. It's hard to see what the worse is, but there are, there are scenarios of military takeover. None of, there's no sign of what will happen. Nobody can predict. But because you can't predict, and we should be honest, we really don't know. Even the, even the people who seem to know the most about what's going on there really don't know that much. James Palmer wrote a great piece about this for foreign policy. Be honest about how little, how much of a black box the Chinese leadership is. So you just don't know. Tiananmen seemed crazy, and of course, and, and while it was going, it went through this period of saying, why are they on the streets? Don't they know it's gonna happen too? They're still on the streets. Maybe this is a moment right. things could change. So social movements, social change, it's always unpredictable. But thanks for that question. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I was born in Hong Kong, and now I'm in the US Foreign Service. And so a two-part question, one is, what is the role of the U.S. government? We passed um, the, the Democracy Act for Hong Kong. I'm not sure what that means exactly in the long term. The second part of the question is um, being in, looking at the, the rest of the 
U.S. government, there's the level of ignorance about China, about many places. But in this case, let's talk about China and about Chinese policy. It's extremely high. And yet we come up with um, different uh, funding programs and uh, different initiatives to counter that with very little knowledge base. Question for you is, this level of ignorance in the grand scheme of things in looking at historical data, what exactly does that mean for the U.S. in this great game approach down the road? So a couple, of, that's a lot of things. So one I'll say is the, the United States won't solve this problem. It's not, it's not, you know, it's going to be solved by Hong Kong people. Right. Keeping international attention on Hong Kong matters a lot, whatever form it takes. And it is a check on the most in it it, it 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 forces the repression to at least be somewhat subtler than uh, even though it's not been very <laughs> subtle but it, it if you want to talk about checks on certain kinds of horrific outcomes international attention helps when it comes to American ignorance about China and especially looking at this room and I won't um, embarrass people by pointing them out there are people who are incredibly knowledgeable about China and spend a lot of their time trying to raise awareness about China. There are, there are great journalists on the, in the field. Some of the, some of the press corps is just incredible, their, their knowledge. There are more academics now who are trying to communicate to broader audiences than there used to be. All of these things are there that could minimize um, the ignorance. But there's less funding for area studies on campuses than there used to be which also opens a space for funding to be gotten from other places. And you have to have people who are willing to pay attention to the writing that's going on about China and maybe to keep space in their mind for more than one story about Asia being interesting at a time. And, you know, I mean, I complain about limited attention to China, but try to get attention to India. You didn't, I mean, Kashmir was, a giant story in the summer and into the and the the moves under Modi, and lots of Americans didn't have anything to didn't have any awareness of that because the NBA didn't get involved. You know there were there were there were not the hooks and things. China gets more attention than most other parts of the distant world, but yet it's also it's often fleeting, and it often doesn't really pay attention to history, as m or it pays attention to history in a way that actually messes up the understanding of it. It pays attention to history in this way of 5,000 years. It accepts some of the Chinese Communist Party's view of a unified history. It doesn't talk about things like it was touch or go 100 years ago whether Cantonese or Mandarin would be the national language. It was touch or go how many ethnic minority groups the People's Republic of China would say China has. There's accessible writing on these subjects, but the question is, will people read them? There's accessible presentations. There are people within the government trying to raise awareness within Congress, but who shows up when there's, uh, when there's an event held? There's probably a little bit more knowledge, but it doesn't, it ends up, the sum total is never enough. So, thanks. Hi, this has been a great event, so oh, thank you. Sorry to say, but the Peace Corps just got cut in China. The Peace Corps in China Forget about what it did for actually influencing China, but former Peace Corps volunteers are several of the best writers on China who exist. Peter Hessler, Rob Schmitz. I mean, the idea that you cut that at this moment so that you don't have that in the pipeline is terrible. Yeah. And Michael Meyer. So, <clears throat> thanks. My, my question, uh, it's actually a multi-part question, I, I hope, uh, is about Taiwan and its uh, sort of relevance to the whole uh, thing here. Uh, is there any degree of coordination or sort of help, assistance in any way f to the protesters in Hong Kong from Taiwan? Is that a bad idea or a good idea for there to be? Does China fear, have more to fear from uh, Taiwan or they're feeling stronger about Taiwan than they are about Hong Kong? Um, so anyway, that's the, that's the collection of questions. Great. It's so wonderful having a DC audience because they always ask the questions you wanted to ask but forgot to ask. So thank you so much. Carry on. Very entwined, and mm -hmm. protesters from the two places have been communicating and trying to learn from each other for a long time. Um, and that, I think, is important. Um, they're totally entwined because the One Country, Two Systems proposal for Hong Kong was supposed to be a potential model for Taiwan. Right. 
And so the idea that was um, in the same year the rat piece that I've been trying to place was that the slogan was Hong Kong's present could be Taiwan's future. Look at what's happening in Hong Kong, people of Taiwan. Pay attention, that could be you. And it was said by Beijing in a kind of positive way. Right. And now, in 2014, some Hong Kong protesters putting, Taiwan, beware. Right, right. Hong Kong now could be Taiwan tomorrow. Right. And so it's, they're interconnected. I don't think it's that, and, <coughs> and it is one of the things that, um, the biggest thing that Beijing is worried, has been worried about is that what's happening in Hong Kong will spread into the mainland. And they've tried very hard to control and right. to maximize the sense on the mainland that what's going on in Hong Kong is, is violent riots, you don't want to touch. And, there has, and when anybody expresses sympathy for the protests on the, on the mainland, then they're shut up very quickly. Right. So they're more worried about that in the terms of right. spread. Short term, right. But of course, you know, Taiwan, it's intimately connected. And again, with the virus, Taiwan status matters to all of us. Taiwan was initially kept, has been kept out of the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm, Any right. place with proximity to a, a pandemic, you should get all the information you can. Uh, Beijing has made some moves to at least allow Taiwan some um, more engagement with WHO while denying it membership, to at least acknowledge that. But still, this is a sign of how it's a real problem to have one country claiming right. control over another place that really is independent. And Taiwan deserves, gosh, m much more. Events in Taiwan get so little attention compared to how interesting they are, right, right. as well as everything else. Thank you. And we do have time for these two last pretty quick questions. Hi, thank you very much for this great talk. So my name is Cody Bunton. I study technology and social media and political engagement at New Jersey Institute of Technology. So. My question, but first, a comment to your uh, answer about the role of the United States in this and, and how issues in the, in, the, in the U.S. democracy is having issues across their impact in the globe. There's a study about how Ukrainians have seen or have felt about the impeachment trials in the United States, and they're actually pretty optimistic about this. Like, at least there's, there's some use in impeachment happening, that there's some, uh, some group of people in the government standing up to a strongman kind of leadership. So that's at least some reason to be optimistic about this. I'll take anything. Yeah. Um, and then my question is really about, so Twitter's gotten mentioned in a couple of, in a, in a couple of the discussions here. I'm very interested in the role of new, new media and technology in, in this, because on the one hand, you know, in 2014, we had a very, very like, or at the time, maybe a declining, but, but generally optimistic view of social media and its democratization and, the, and the, the value it has and whether like it's accelerating capabilities for democratization. But now we have a very different view. And yet Hong Kong still, the, p the protesters in Hong Kong still have been able to use this technology despite their proximity and engagement with one of the most sophisticated censorship machines in the entire world. So I'm really curious about what your, what your thoughts are and like, what is the role of new technology in this space? Let's take the last question and then we'll... Okay, last question. Uh, Mario Klo, uh, MA student at SAIS. Um, one question I wanted to ask was the mutual reflection you see of the mainland and of Hong Kong upon each other. And can you talk a little bit both about the vilification of Hong Kong protesters within China while the protests were going on, but then also, and especially in Guangdong, any protests within the mainland or any initial signs of protest that see themselves modeled on Hong Kong? All right, all right. So these, these are kind of connected because I think, so social media both aids mobilization and can create problems too. And can, so it, it does both things. And I think we swing between techno-utopianism and techno-optimism techno and techno-pessimism. And, and in some ways that's happened with each new media as it's come along and it's, as with many things, what happens with the internet and social media is the same thing we've seen before, but faster and more intensely. And it has to do with the um, demonization and control of the, s the spin. What negative visions uh, across the border back and forth are disproportionately incidents that play into enduring negative stereotypes both direction end up taking on added force because of images that are shown over and over again. And this is clearest on the mainland side, 
when a very small number of acts of violence are shown over and over again to give an impression of, of a much more violent movement than it is. Um, with s there, ha there, there are trickles. There are some signs of a, just recently with the virus, this is another thing, of, you know, do you hear the people sing is being sung in Wuhan and some very unusual intellectuals, one, five demands, not one less is a call of the protesters and there are some dissident intellectuals on the mainland that are saying in an open letter, five demands and <laughs> we have five demands, which echoes that. But on the whole, the flow of actual um, sympathy protests haven't been that, that big. But I'm glad you brought up um, Canton. When I give a talk like this or I'm part of a panel on um, a campus and there are a lot of students there, and one thing that comes up is that what can help cause a problem is that there is a, there's a way in which both on the mainland and Hong Kong people view people on the other side as worse, but somehow cocky. And that's, you know, that, that, that you think you're so good, but you aren't. But there'll be usually somebody, and this is, I think, very important in the audience who says, well, I feel a little left out in this. I'm from southern China, and I kind of like the fact that Cantonese identity, uh, Cantonese language is being used. I have a lot of friends and I have family in Hong Kong, but I have also family friends here and I feel caught between for this. And I think it's really important, this is another thing the virus has shown. Hong Kong, uh, China is a very diverse place. There are all kinds of regional prejudices and um, demonization. People in Wuhan right now are suffering from stigmatization. There is, I think with a lot of this also, with the Hong Kong thing, there, there has been some very unpleasant stigmatizing of mainland uh, people and disparaging of it, but there's a debate within the movement about that. In the same way there's a debate within the movement about acts of violence. And members of the, the movement apologize for acts of violence where the government doesn't apologize for acts of violence. There's, there's, it's, there's not clear signs of a debate. So that's one way that, um, that it's, it's, it's different as well. But I think these are, these are exactly, these are really, okay, DC kinds of questions. So uh, <laughs> I'm impressed. And politics and prose is a place I've always wanted to speak. So um, it's, it's great to have that opportunity. Well, terrific. And you know, definitely watch this space, by which we mean thousands of miles away. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating, fraught year. And thank you so much to Jeff for, for sharing with us his terrific insight. And uh, thank you all for being here with your terrific questions. Thanks. So copies of Jeff's book are available at the checkout desk. He'll be up here signing.